Good morning. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name is Tom Fress, and I'm your host for the next hour. You're listening to LibertyRadioLive.com. It's my pleasure to be here this morning, and I'm appreciative that you've taken the time out of your morning to join me. We're going to continue reading and discussing the book Behind the Dictators by L.H. Lehman. And I hope that you have found... Uh, on my website inquisitionupdate.org under research books this book entitled Behind the Dictators you've downloaded it and you're following along with me we're currently I'm going to back up for continuity purposes to about midway down the page on page 39 of the book and for the next few days I hope to elaborate and enunciate a little bit more upon the subjects that I spoke about with John Daniel on the broadcast yesterday. The hope is that you will see, as I do, taking shape in the next few pages of this book, stark similarities of what's going on in this country today. Rome is following a recipe, I believe, and as in... Nazi Germany, the Vatican was trying to impose a hierarchical form of government in Europe to displace the republics and the democracies that sprang out of the Protestant Reformation. This was an attempt by the Vatican to bring Europe, Protestant Europe, back under the control of the papacy. Now, I believe that that is Rome's strategy, not only for Europe, but also for the United States and the rest of the world. So, if that be the case, and I assert that it is, what strategy might Rome use? And we were looking, we're looking in history how Rome conquered Europe and reasserted itself in its traditional place as the king of Europe the papacy uh, reinstituted itself or attempted to we're going to see that same thing taking place in the United States and what similarities are we finding today that remind us of what Rome did during this period now it says but it was not until after World War I that the active plan for Catholic restoration Remember, Catholic restoration means returning the papacy to temporal authority in Europe, reestablishing the hierarchical order of things, that form of government under which the Pope ruled so supremely during the Middle Ages. That rule was overthrown during the, uh, the French Revolution and by the Protestant Reformation, and the Vatican's intent was to restore the temporal sword of the, of the papacy over all the governments of Europe. So that is Catholic restoration. You have to understand what Catholic restoration means. The restoring the papacy to sovereignty and control in Europe. That which was uh, overthrown by the Protestant Reformation. All right, it was during World War I that the active plan for Catholic restoration began to take shape. Before the coming of Pope Pius XI in 1922, the Catholic Church had been forced into a more or less defensive position toward the liberal spirit of the modern times. What was the liberal spirit? What was the modern times? The modern times is defined by the Protestant Reformation. That liberal spirit is defined by the Protestant Reformation. It's the Protestant Reformation that is the target of the Vatican. Now, but with the election of this admittedly pro-Jesuit, pro-fascist pope, that is, Pope Pius XI, Mussolini and Hitler also appeared on the scene, and in combination with them, the Catholic Church took the offensive so it was Pope Pius IX, 1922, 
uh, that they a uh, position that they were taking in the defensive. But now, during this period of Franco and Hitler and Pope Pius the Ninth, this is this period of nineteen, you know, during the, the the First World War and leading up to the Second World War, the Roman Catholic Church took the offensive. Okay, this is what this is what basically characterizes the Second World War when the Vatican departed from a defensive posture against the liberal Protestant attitudes of Europe and took an offensive posture, went on the offense, used Mussolini and Hitler and the other fascist dictators of Europe together with fascist Pope Pius XI to overthrow the Protestant Reformation and restore the papal throne. All right. I hope this isn't too redundant for some people, but I'm I'm estimating that a good portion of my listeners are just as ignorant about the Vatican's role in history, particularly that of World War II, as I was. I came from the the uh, watered down government sponsored schools, just like most of my listeners, and they didn't tell me about any of this stuff. So if I seem to be elementary, and if I seem to be repetitious, it's for those listeners who are hearing this for the first time. It says, with the election of this admittedly pro-Jesuit, pro-fascist pope, that's Pope Pius XI, Mussolini and Hitler also appeared on the scene, and in combination with them, the Roman Catholic Church took the offensive. The following from the historical work, of Karl Boca, an ardent supporter of Catholic restoration, in other words, the overthrow of Protestantism, is to the point is to the point, he says, quote, at this decisive moment the Pope seized the reins and took into his hands the unified control of all fields of endeavor in which his predecessors had distinguished themselves. Now who were his predecessors? Who are we referring to? his predecessors that existed prior to the Protestant Reformation. The papacy lost, for the most part, its temporal authority in the world because the Protestant Reformation threatened the very seat of the papacy, said that it was a an imposture, that, that the Pope was not at all the vicar of Christ, but the, but the, uh, but the uh, Antichrist on the earth. He had no apostolic succession because it is the apostol it is the uh, the uh, the antichrist church. He's not the apostle of Jesus Christ. He's the the apostle of Satan himself. Okay, so with that knowledge, that new knowledge that they gained from reading the Bible for themselves rather than being spoon fed by a priest, they came to this stark realization of what the Roman Catholic Church truly was. And so that jeopardized all of the Roman Catholic kings who governed all the European nations at that time who answered to the authority of the Pope. Tremendous upheaval, the Protestant Reformation. And this information about the Protestant Reformation is almost unheard of in the churches today. It's not considered politically correct to even talk about it. But our very lives, not only the life of this nation, this Protestant nation, but Protestantism itself in this country and our very lives depend upon us acknowledging, understanding and acknowledging this history. Because history is repeating itself. And we don't recognize it because we don't know about this history. That's why I'm reading it. Okay. They took, uh, they, he wanted to restore the papacy to the power that his predecessors had. And it says, this was the be- this is continuing the quote, it says, this was the beginning of Catholic action, of far-reaching importance, of the entrance of the Roman Catholic Church into the fight, into the battle for moral and religious renovation, and for the reform of social institutions. Now let me stop before I continue the quote. I don't want to get too far ahead here. This was the beginning of Catholic action. What is Catholic action? Catholic action is a, is a term to describe a broad 
area of concern. But basically, it is the inspiration and utilization of the Catholic laity to take a proactive stand in society and to promote Roman Catholic teaching and doctrine and the hierarchical church, the hierarchical form of government, to restore the papacy's temporal throne in the world and to put the kings of the earth back under subjection, back into the subjection of the papacy. All right? That is the Roman Catholic layman's organization in that regard. And that's why I say, and I legitimately say, that every Roman Catholic, in no matter what country they live, are a potential fifth column for the Pope. And look, look, if Roman Catholics, as they are taught from cradle to grave, that their salvation depends upon them being members of the Roman Catholic Church and supporting their church, the church militant, And that if they don't take up the sword for the papacy, they're heretical, and they're ipso facto excommunicated and damned. So there's a moral and spiritual obligation and motivation of every Roman Catholic, if he fully understands what his responsibilities are to Rome, first and foremost, whether he be an American, a Canadian, or a Mexican, or a European, or an Australian, if they comprehend what their role is in the Roman Catholic Church, they must first be Romans, Catholics, and defend their church against all opposition. All right, that makes them, by definition, expatriates. Their first loyalty is to the Pope and to Rome. Then, what loyalty can they allow their no, their own nations to have over their church state? None. All right. So now, some people are very, very apologetic to Roman Catholics, and I'm very a Pope, uh, apologetic to Roman Catholics in that so much as that what much of what I say is as much for the benefit of Roman Catholics as it is for Protestants. And this will become more and more apparent as we continue in, the, in, the, in this book. Because for the most part, Roman Catholics don't in this country don't realize that they're under just as much threat as Protestants are. They don't fully comprehend, and they reject the notion that the papacy considers them liberals, schismatics, heretics, because they've lived in a free society where the Pope is held at arm's length. And they've enjoyed the Protestant liberties in this Protestant republic. They've enjoyed the, 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 the laws of this land that, are, that run directly contradictory, diametrically opposed to Roman Catholic law, Roman Catholic teaching, and Roman Catholic tradition. So... Rome sees Americans, American Catholics, as liberal. And history, and this book is going to show us how Rome acts toward liberal Catholics when push comes to shove. And it is this understanding that when Roman Catholics begin to understand this, many of them, it is my hope and my prayer, that they will regard me as one of their best friends because they don't realize what situation they're in regarding the papacy and what is about to happen in this country. Many of them think that if there's any purges to take place in this country, it'll be the rigid, Bible-believing, authorized King James Version uh, uh Protestant heretics that will suffer. But no, history is going to show us that liberal Catholics have first to be put out of the way before the Roman Catholic Church can engage the more powerful element, 
those who carry the Bible. Okay, and this, this is history repeating itself, and this will become clear as we continue. All right, this was the beginning of Catholic action, of far-reaching importance, of the entrance of the Roman Catholic Church into the fight, through Catholic action, I will add, into the battle for moral and religious renovation and for the reform of social institutions. <coughs> now, continue with this line of thought. This is the obligation of every Roman Catholic laity to enter the fight and to function to reform moral and religious uh, uh, aspects of society and to reform social institutions to make them conform to that uh, Roman Catholic social doctrine. They have an entire uh, study on the social order, and this is backed up by encyclicals. I'll just name two of them, uh, Rerum Novarum and Deus Domini, and even the, la the latest one by Pope Benedict XVI, Caritas and Veritate, Charity and Truth. These are all about reforming the social order. And the social order is the main object of reform in the establishment of the Pope's global New World Order. So Catholic action is front and center. And that point was made in Benedict XVI encyclical, Caritas and Veritate, where he called all Roman Catholic laymen to use their occupations and their avocations to promote Roman Catholic doctrine and teaching, and to strengthen the position of the Roman Catholic Church in the various lands in which they live. And this Catholic action is taking place right before our very eyes, and we don't recognize it for what it is, because we simply don't know what it's about. Didn't even know it existed for the most part, nor how it operates. And hopefully, through this book, we'll get an understanding of this. Now, continue with the quote, and this intervention by Roman Catholic, by, by Catholic action, these endeavors to reform moral and religious institutions and even social institutions, this intervention had for its end the destruction of the liberal spirit of the 19th century. What was the liberal spirit of the 19th century? The Protestant Reformation. And it continues, and the triumph of the Christian idea. The triumph of the Christian idea. So what do you get from this? That Protestantism isn't Christian. And that Roman Catholicism is. And not liberal Catholicism, but the form of Catholicism that Adolf Hitler tried to impose upon Europe, Jesuit Catholicism, hierarchical, Holy Mother Church. And that's what's going to happen in this country through Catholic action. Each individual Roman Catholic is a warrior for the Pope. And they operate in every sphere of our society. And they hold this, this directive, this initiative, secret in their hearts. And Protestants are completely unaware of it. It exists as much or more today in this country than it did in Europe during the Nazi Germany period. Catholic action. Know what it is. Know how to recognize it. You have to understand a little bit about Roman Catholic canon law. You have to understand your Bible, and with the knowledge of the Scriptures and God's holy law, then you can understand, by contrast, that Roman Catholic can uh, canon law and Roman Catholic tradition and Roman Catholic hierarchical government runs di diametrically counter to God's holy law. It replaces God's holy law. And where is this done? In the state houses and Washington, D.C., the Supreme Court, the military, banking, business, right on down to the street sweeper. Wherever you find Catholics, you find Catholic influence. 
All right. It's a war. It's a spiritual war. Okay? And it's everywhere. You can't walk out of your house without being influenced by it. You just don't, re- you just don't most, for the most part, don't recognize that it exists simply because you've been kept ignorant of this. Now, the book continues. Since then, we have witnessed Catholics' open support of every step taken by Nazi fascism to impose authoritarian regimes upon all peoples. Its active cooperation in the system, systematic oppression exercised by the fa- uh, fascist regime in Italy itself, its secret agreement with Hitler's Nazi socialism, and don't forget that it was the Vatican that first recognized Hitler's regime. That should be a tip-off right off the bat. Its support of Mussolini's shameful conquest of Ethiopia and even of Japan's invasion of China. Its open alliance with Franco in his rebellion against the Spanish Republic. Its joy at the annexation of Austria into Nazi Germany. And the obliteration of democratic, read Protestant, democratic Czechoslovakia. Its part in the triumph of Leon de Grella's Rexis party in Belgium. And its fulsome praise for the French fascist state under which the good Marshal Pétain took the place of the defunct French Republic. Now, what was the French Republic? It was an opposition to the authoritarian structure of the Roman Catholic Church. That's why they called it a republic. It had a constitution that protected minorities. Who were the minorities? Protestants. France is a Catholic country. And they wanted peace. Peace. Not perpetual war like the Pope wants. And so they rebelled against the papacy, and they formed a republic. They were, for the most part, Catholic, but their their idea was to keep the Pope out of public affairs. Keep him out of government. Because every time the papacy inserted, inserted itself into the political life, there was war and conflict between the Roman Catholic Church and non-Catholics in the land. The land always gets soaked with blood every time the Vatican gets control in a government. That's what's going to happen here. Now he continues, after Pearl Harbor, the Vatican accepted General Ken Harada's ambassador uh, from Tokyo to the Holy See. So what's this author implying? That even Pearl Harbor even America's war with Japan was a result of this counter-reformation that the Pope was waging during the Second World War through Hitler and through our own government. Now, we're going to capitalize on this. Uh, I see we're coming up on the break. But you have to understand, we can't be too narrowly focused or we miss the fact that even the United States of America was used. Unbeknownst to the American people, the United States was used to help this counter-reformation and the strengthening of the Pope's position, not only in Europe, but the whole world. And if you think that has changed, you're sadly mistaken. I had initially thought to continue reading and making some further points, but but I th- I think it best, at least for now, to to make some more points about what we've just read, linking what happened during the Second World War to what's happening today, because that's really that's really what's important in this discussion. Now look at the changes that took place prior to, prior to and during the Second World War. We've just discussed them. We witnessed Catholicism's open support for every step taken by the Nazi fascists to impose authoritarian regimes upon all people. And here's how they did it. The Roman Catholic Church cooperated in the systematic oppression exercised by the fascist regime in Italy itself, its secret agreement with Hitler's Nazi socialism, 
its support of Mussolini's shameful conquest of Ethiopia and even Japan's invasion of China, its open alliance with Franco and the rebellion against the Spanish Republic, its joy at the annexation of Austria to uh, Nazi Germany and the obliteration of democratic Czechoslovakia, its part in the final triumph of Leon de Grella's Rexis party in Belgium, and its fulsome praise for the French fascist state, which under the good Marshal Pétain took the place of the defunct French Republic. And it says, after Pearl Harbor, the Vatican accepted General Ken Harada as the ambassador to Tokyo to the Holy See. Roman influence through its whole thing. And what is it? Regime change. Government changes. Manipulation in politics. War. That's how Rome achieves her end. Always by war. And what do we see today? War. Regime change. And it brings me... First of all, they replaced... Germany's republic with a, a, a Nazi hierarchical government. Now, many would argue I'm stepping beyond the bounds of uh, reality when I say this, but they've done the same thing in our government. No longer do the people elect the president. I assert, as do others in this research, that the Council on Foreign Relations, an arm of the Vatican, picks all the candidates for presidency that the people have absolutely no function other than just uh, part of the delusion. They go to the polls, they make it look all legitimate, but there's no legitimacy involved. And so now we don't have a democratic government. We have a papal kingdom. So without our knowledge, and even the reality of this is, is, is just almost impossible to sink in to people who just don't want to believe it. But it's true. No matter who sits in the White House, whether he be Democratic or Republican, the Vatican's benefit continues. Who benefits? Key bono. The papacy. And we no longer have a republic. We no longer have a constitutional republic. The Constitution has been done away with. We have a papal king. That's my assertion. The United States government has already undergone much of the transformation that took place in Nazi Germany with the replacement of the, of the German Republic with, the, with this hierarchical Vatican-picked Roman Catholic Adolf Hitler and Mussolini and Franco. They're all Catholics. All right, you can deny it till the cows come home, but the evidence just won't support your denial. It's 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 no argument to say, well, Tom, you're just wrong. You're just you're you're just you're just wrong. That's not an argument. The facts support the thesis that our constitution has been done away, replaced with Roman Catholics and Roman Catholic canon law, such as the Patriot Act. Now, what about the other regime changes we're seeing around the world? Did we see regime change in Iraq? Might we suppose that the Pope needed to replace Saddam Hussein since there were no weapons of mass destruction, since they had absolutely nothing? Admittedly, our government admits they had absolutely nothing to do with 9-11 which is a direct contradiction for what they said at the beginning of the war. I mean, after all, we did go to war, and we didn't go to war with Iraq just for something to do. We went there because the, the, the assertion was made, Saddam Hussein was supporting terrorist organizations around the world, and he was ultimately responsible for 9-11. Besides, they had weapons of mass destruction, none of which have ever materialized. And the government is simply George W. Bush. I'll have, I'll have, I'll have a, a video on my website where George W. Bush mocks looking under the podium while he was giving a speech. No, 
No mass, no weapons of mass destruction there. <laughs> and then he looks over here. No, nope, no weapons of mass destruction there. And he did it in front of the press. And I saw the camera divert to some of the reaction of the press members who were in attendance at that feast, that speech. And they laughed heartily until they realized what he was doing. That he had called this war, this country to war under false pretenses. And that thousands of Americans died, not to mention the potentially millions that died in Iraq. Very sobering, the brazen audacity of the Roman Catholic Church and her Roman Catholic minions in the White House. And we're just loath to accept this tr the truth because we just won't accept that this kind of diabolical government could possibly be our government. But it's the truth. History attests to the truth. Now, what other regime changes are we seeing? Currently, everybody's all abuzz about what's going on in, in uh, Egypt right now. Let me tell you something about history of Egypt. Now, I'm not an expert on Egyptian history, but I know one thing. Uh, Mubarak's predecessor was Sadat. He went to war with Israel in the 67 uh, Six Day War. And Israel trounced them. Okay? That's believed all over the world to be divine providence. That God intervened. And little tiny Israel defeated the whole entire Muslim world. And the most powerful, the most wealthy Muslim nation, Egypt, turned and ran with their tail between their legs. And they took Temple Mount. The Jews got Temple Mount. They won Jerusalem in the battle. And since then, Sadat signed a peace treaty, a non-aggression pact with Israel. Is that what Rome wants? Have you been paying attention to Inquisition update? Do you know anything about the futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy that I focus on all the time? That Rome is trying to refulfill her version, her interpretation of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, particularly verse 27. That passage was completely fulfilled by Christ 2,000 years ago. There's no future 70th week. There's no seven years of tribulation. But that's not what Rome wants us to believe. Rome says, no, the 70th week is separated by 2,000 years, and it'll be, it'll be fulfilled at the end of time. And you've heard the story. You've heard me talk about this before. So if Rome's going to refulfill the set, since it's already been fulfilled, it must be refulfilled if it's ever going to be fulfilled again, right? <laughs> Confused already? I'll tell you what, it is confusing. But through the first, second, and the current Third World War, Rome established the nation state of Israel. And now there's all this talk about building a temple and a proposed peace treaty, a seven year peace treaty that will be reevaluated after three and a half years midterm. And then the Antichrist, of course, then will be revealed. Everybody, you know who it is. The whole purpose of which is to hide the very fact that the Pope is the Antichrist. Now, to fulfill all this stuff, in the current nation-state of Israel, which has been literally cut in half by Palestinians, Muslims, who have sought with support from the United States government, opposition to this nation-state of Israel and have fomented a perpetual state of war that every little Jew in Israel worries about some mortar or some rocket being fired into his kibbutz and blowing him to smithereens. Subjecting these Jews, who Rome is responsible for bringing him to Israel in the first place, Rome is responsible for the creation of the nation-state of Israel, putting those Jews 
who they couldn't finish off during the Second World War, during the Holocaust, they live, making them live in a, in a state of perpetual war to wear them out. But it just so happens that the Palestinians have been kind of tired of war themselves. Not a lot going on. And Rome's ready to get on about her business of fulfilling this 70th week of Daniel. And the perpetual war environment that they've created for the Jews in Israel is kind of petering out. So they've got to get rid of this peace-loving regime in, in Egypt. After the 67 war, Sadat signed a non-aggression treaty with Israel. And for the most part, has been peaceful with Israel. And Bar and and and, Bar and uh, Mubarak has just perpetuated that state of peace. Now we leave all the other economic and all the other corruption and all of this for other discussions, but for the Vatican's purpose, since all the other efforts to maintain a, an environment of war in, in Israel has, has kind of waned, it is my suggestion that we're talking about a regime change in Egypt to replace the Sadat Mubarak peace-loving regime with an anti-Israel regime. The Muslim Brotherhood. And we're going to see tensions rise in the Middle East when that regime change takes place. This is the same strategy that the Vatican used in preparation for the Second World War. Replacing peace-loving democratic republics, Protestant democratic republics, with authoritarian, top-down, Nazi-style, Vatican-influenced governments. And that's what we're seeing today all over the world in the United States also. Not just Iran, not just Egypt, but in the United States as well. And what's the target? It's Israel, man. The Vatican is bringing to bear all the powers of earth against Israel. The target is to either convert the Jews to Catholicism or die. That's the ultimatum that Rome has made forever. Convert or die. And that's going to be the strategy right here in the United States of America, too. When we're done fighting all of our papal proxy wars... Then we're going to start purging this country of heretics and liberals, just like they did in Nazi Germany. And I'd hope to get into that portion of this book today, but the comments made about uh, Egypt right now and Iran with, and the Palestinians with regard to the, the war environment that the, that the Vatican seeks to maintain in Israel, I thought was more important. So with that having been said, I think I'll continue now. Remember all these changes that were made all over Europe, replacing dem democratic republics, Protestant democratic republics, with authoritarian dictatorial fascist dictators or those that would capitulate to uh, Hitler. Now, it says the full account of events in Germany from 1918 till the rise of Hitler to power has yet to be written. Remember, this book was written in 1942. But it cannot be denied that they were cleverly renew, uh, maneuvered to their outcome by the machinations of Jesuit diplomacy. So this author is plainly telling us that all of these regime changes that took place prior to and during the Second World War were as a direct result of Jesuit diplomacy. And we see the same effect today. And where is that Jesuit diplomacy exercised in the world from the United States? The White House and the Secretary of State. Jesuit diplomacy. 
And I believe the United States is as much responsible for the upheaval in Egypt as the corrupt Egyptians themselves. Because Rome is operating and manipulating the, the events in Israel through the United States. The United States has become a proxy, a diplomatic proxy for the Vatican. Now it says, the owning classes, and I take this to mean the, the, the property owners of Europe at this time, whose liberal... Uh, whose liberalism was less an expression of ideal convictions than of material interests, were gripped with the fear of the growth of socialism under the Weimar Republic. Now let me elaborate a little bit on this. Who were the owning classes? Well, for the purpose of of this discussion, you need to understand that during the Protestant Reformation and the upheaval that took place all over Europe... The replacement of the papal kings with democratically elected governments. The Roman Catholic Church lost a lot of property. Prior to the Protestant Reformation, the Pope owned all the land. And I've even heard figures of uh, one-third of of England belonged to the papacy. One-third of the land, the productive land mass of Great Britain, belonged to the papacy. You know, the the Roman Catholics gave their property to the church. They've always been inspired to give their support to the church. And the Roman Catholic Church was the most landed institution in Europe prior to the Protestant Reformation. But when the Protestant Reformation took place, the kings of Europe converted to Protestantism. Why? Not so much because they conceived the truth of Protestantism not so much that they perceived that the papacy was the Antichrist and the Roman Catholic Church was the synagogue of Satan no, they saw in it economic benefit that if they if they professed Protestantism and shook off the authoritarian structure of the Roman Catholic Church they, they threw off the authority of the Pope to run their governments then they had justification to take back all the land that previously served the papacy, which vastly improved each nation's economic health. So these were the landed classes. These were the owning classes, and the Vatican regarded them as liberal, heretic, and schismatic not only for their phony, some were genuine, of course, but for the most part, their profession of Protestantism was aimed toward an economic end rather than a spiritual or religious end. And the Vatican regarded them as liberal. Liberal. Because conservatism in the eyes of the Vatican is those who submit to the authority of the papacy, the vicar of Christ, the replacement of God on earth. So the Protestant Reformation completely changed, and, and land changed hands. They literally, they literally took the land back from the papacy and put it back into productive use for, for the various nations. Okay, the owning classes, and this is who they're talking about, whose liberalism was less an expression of ideal convictions, as I've already pointed out, than of material interests, were gripped, they were gripped with the fear of the growing socialism under the Weimar Republic. All right, the Weimar Republic was socialist. That's a top-down form of government, a government more conducive to the hierarchical ideal that the Roman Catholic Church wanted to reinstitute. All right, and it says, by clever propaganda, here we get the Jesuits again, (coughs) <coughs> Excuse me. By clever propaganda, Roman Catholic forces succeeded in convincing them that a hierarchical church was their best protection against the attacks of the lower classes. So even these 
even these uh, socialists, or even these, excuse me, here's where's the term, these liberals who were afraid of this, this social order under the Weimar Republic were taught that it was better to go under the hierarchical church, if the, that the hierarchical church form of government was a lesser evil, is what I'm trying to say. All right? Look how they co-opted these people. And it says, on the other hand, they used the anti-liberalism of German socialists to prove to these latter that political Catholicism and socialist movement both oppo uh Excuse me, let me read this again. On the other hand, they used the anti-liberalism of German socialists to prove to these latter that political Catholicism and the socialist movement, both opponents of this liberalism, could form a solid basis for common action in the domain of political action. All right, and it says the coalition between the Social Democrats and the Catholic Center Party was the result of this maneuver. So they drove the Social Democrats into, into uh, toward the Roman Catholic Center Party. This is how they did it. And that was the result of this, this Jesuit diplomacy. The Social Democrats in Germany united with the Center Party, the Catholic Center Party. In reality, it was an unconscious submission of the former that is, the Social Democrats, to Jesuit Catholicism, which was thus enabled to use Catholic Democratic politicians, those politicians of the Social Democrats, and the anti-Jesuits for its own ends. So they co-opted their opposition, put them in, give them the lesser of the two evils, and they literally co-opted them. Now, this is exactly what has happened since Vatican Council II. We've been given this fear of liberalism and atheism as a justification and a, and a choice of, of, of the, 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 the choice of the lesser of two evils to join with the Roman Catholic Church. Do you see what I'm saying? The ecumenical movement using atheism and secularism and uh, uh, humanism as the great threat to Christianity. That was what Vatican Council II was all about. Atheism and, and secular human, humanism was the great big boogeyman. And so given the lesser of two evils, the evangelicals joined the ecumenical movement to reunite the Roman Catholic Church. And now we have completely destroyed Protestantism in the country. Now it's the Roman Catholic Church. They have co-opted all the power of the Protestant churches to now serve papal ends in this country. That is the real horror of the ecumenical movement. It's a re a fulfillment of what they did and what we've just read between the Social Democrats and the Catholic Center Party in Germany. And it has worked. And what could happen next? We'll talk about that tomorrow on Inquisition Update. Thanks for listening.